So this dedicated lecture is also about a little bit more technical concepts, um, but it, it's an introduction. It's an introduction about AI in general um, in games. But let me start first with the standard intro. So again, if you're here for the first time at the stream, um, this is the stream from the Graz University of Technology um, Game Dev, Game Design, Game Development courses. So if you're interested in the course material and also taking part in the assignment, feel free to do so. The material is at gamelabgraz.com. And we're using Twitter. <clears throat> I'm using Twitter and hope more and more of the students and people interested in this topic will also use Twitter for that. Um, and then please use the hashtag TOGameDev that we can also find your stuff. Thank you, username is work in progress um, for the clickable link in the chat. Um, and the lectures are, since we are not having any physical lectures and there was a new announcement um, today at the press conference from the government that the university won't open until the end of this term. So you will be stuck with me online for the next couple of weeks or months. Um, so unfortunately, there won't be any live lectures, but we will have constantly cool um, Twitch lectures. And again, it, this gives us the opportunity to have really cool guest lectures from all around the world. Alex is, by the way, from Santa Cruz. So he that's also one of the reasons why we're having those lectures so late, that we're a little bit more flexible to invite all the guests from the other side, uh, or from, from, from the F. So he is nine hours um, behind us. Um, feel free to ask all the time questions in the Twitch chat. While we are having the um, guests on, on Discord, uh, though, I won't be able to able to see any questions in Discord because um, we are using the video from Discord. Yeah, so the Button Festival got rescheduled too in Graz. So for those of you who are interested in the Button Festival, this is a gaming festival happening every time in um, in 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 Graz, and this already got rescheduled for the second time and will happen on the first weekend of September. Um, Spation Space is asking, there won't be any on-site lectures for this semester. Yes, this is correct. So there was a new press announcement um, today um, that the universities will stay closed for this term. Um, so research and lecturing is done online. Yeah. Um, but again, this gives us the opportunity to get a little bit more creative with the lectures and wide speakers. We have the assistant professors here for the course. And yeah, good. And if you have any questions, please always ask them um, um, constantly. Good. And there was a homework. So who, who did the homework and played the Stanley parable? Looking at the chat now. It also counts if you have played it before already. Yes, we have a lot of plus, plus, plus years ago. Yes. So how was it? What did you like about um, that game? What um, was what was the main aspect? Was was the main mechanic? Claudia Kirchmeier mentioned that it was fun, but exhausting. Why exhausting? Sheldon37 says it's entertaining and he liked the narrator. So what is this? What, what did you like most about the game? Um, so the game was just uh, to give you a few facts. It was released in 2011, so it's already. This is almost 10 years ago away. Um, and the main, um, the, the developer, the studio was called Galactic Cafe, and apparently it was self-published. Um, very, very interesting game. Um, and the game talks to you. And um, let me summarize some 
um, comments from the from the chat. There's this constant narrator. The game talks to you. You have interesting choices. You think it's a funny, interesting story, and then it, this voice constantly likes to explain you about the game itself. Um, or and yeah, it is quite interesting, especially in the end. Um, Pixel Prophecy also mentioned most interesting was the conversation of the player by their actions and narrator who wants to guide them. So it's a really, really interesting experience. So if you haven't played it, I, I feel it's one of its kind. It's definitely one of the indie games must plays. Um, and yeah, many good things are in this game. The engine which was used was Half-Life 2. And Unity? What? Confused. I think it's a combination. Anyone knows something about this? Yeah, so if you play the demo, there's apparently only one ending. Um, but the, I think one of the most interesting parts of this game is that there are so many different endings, endings, what um, choices you make. And th those are the really interesting ones. Oh yeah, I'm already taking away the next homework. I didn't make, so usually for the next homework, it's sort of democratic, uh, democratic decision. We don't do <laughs> this this week because it was pretty much 50-50 a uh, decision between Line Rider and Stanley Parable. And because of many requests, because apparently my Line Rider skills were so fantastically um, interesting, um, this well, should also make it to the list of games played. So this is Leiden Rider. I'll give it one more try. So basically, this is how you play the game. You have this guy, it looks a little bit, and you are drawing lines and you need to get somewhere. I mean, at least somewhere. Can I, how can I quick start? No. How do I delete? Can I, do I need, ah. Oh. How, how, how can I? <laughs> okay, it, it's not my the game I, I usually play, I guess. Oh, almost there. Good, I'm not the best for demonstrations right now. How can I? New game, yes. If, let's give it one more try. But you can make super fancy, super fancy cool trails. I'm pretty sure this will not work out. Uh, let's make it as easy as possible. Yay! Best game ever. Good, so this is the homework for next week. Linerider.com, obviously it's free to play, you can probably play it um, now. Um, and there are some interesting videos. Let me quickly... Linerider... And Ben Tosman's fifth. This is where we would need sound now. Ah. Okay. Okay. I guess you can hear the sound now. I guess you can hear the sound. Now. pressure but this is pretty much what I expect from you so <laughs> no so, so this this is the homework playing this game you don't need but just as an inspiration good line writer okay so the topic about the, today's lecture is why AI is shaping our games and I will talk a little bit about different concepts about how AI is used in the video games industry I'm pretty sure that I cannot cover the entire topic today um, and, and show all of the slides um, because we will start with the guest speaker um, 730 sharp 
However, um, I want to just give you first um, ideas and discuss a few items because the topic is just huge but highly interesting. So um, just a few resources already in the start. Um, so most of the things I'm going to show today are um, sourced by different scientific papers on the one hand and also by one fantastic book, which I can really highly recommend by Jana Yanakakis and Togelius, Artificial Intelligence and Games, the Game AI book. And also on the website, there are so many fantastic resources about the game development process. Um, and again, those are some scientific conferences which really focus on AI topics. So if you want to learn more um, about the scientific way, um, feel free to browse those sources. Good, but let me ask you, and there's always like this weird part um, without a direct interaction in the classroom, but still interested, chat, what, do you, what are you thinking of when I talk about AI? What are we typically thinking about? Especially in games. So it's a lot of if statements, yeah? That's true. This is really, really true for games. Running, uh, enemies running into a wall when chasing you. This is 100% true for games. Piles of algebra, this steer until they look right. Also really true. It will kill you one day, maybe. Um, yeah, many, many interesting thoughts here. So um, AI is used to create different parts of our game, uh, of our games. It provides things like intelligent or not so intelligent um, any behavior and techniques such as pathfinding. Um, this means that, that your character, if you, if you, for instance, in this, you have this huge map and you click somewhere that your character is automatically finding the path this is pathfinding, or you can create content procedurally. The, there's a, a few aspects we're going to talk um, about today, but with, which we also covered in GDD1. AI, however, can also be used to play our games. Um, the idea, especially to train computers to beat humans in game-like environments such as Jeopardy, chess, or soccer, is absolutely not a new one. Um, but can AI also be used, for instance, to design games? So this will be all a little bit of an interesting question here. Not to play the games, not as part of the development experience, but to actually design mechanics of a game. Um, who knows this movie? Oh, who knows this symbol? Oh no, it's by who? I don't know. Um, good. So when we hear AI, then we immediately think about so many different headlines we read, we read in newspapers, it's all around the news, especially in recent years, you can see a constant trend that AI is becoming increasingly popular. Um, this is this um, Google trend analysis. So you can all, also do this for, for nowadays. Um, yes, Chet says this was Hal from Space Odyssey. Um, and we have interesting headlines about super smart AI we are, are supposed to be super scared of, like Google's AI to detect, to det detect toxic comments can be easily uh, uh, toxic. Facebook is rolling out AI, AI based suicide prevention efforts. However, we always need to ask ourselves the question, is this like really AI? Is this really smart? Or what sort of AI is used in this newspaper headline? So for instance, if we look at this Google's AI to detect toxic comments, we can see here already some score. So a sentence um, can with, with elements such as sentiment analysis, you can detect the, um, whether a sentence is neutral, positive, or negative. In that case, they scored um, the hatefulness of a sentence. And um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure how, again, AI-based um, this is, but it, it's easily foolable. Because here in that case, 
um, there's the sentence, you're great. And then when you modify the sentence with, uh, <laughs> oh no, this is a non, um, a stream, not over 18. So it's a, you are freaking great, but it, with a more coarse word. Um, all of a sudden it gets from absolutely not hateful, like a very, very low um, hatefulness count to a very high one, just because the word freaking um, is in the sentence. So this means that probably what we just heard in the chat that, yeah, um, things like if, sentence, if, if statements uh, probably, yeah, a good hint here, or especially apparently curse words, even though in a wrong context, had a huge impact. So it's probably not that well trained. Um, so the definition of AI is a little bit controversial. So what is AI? What is real AI? And if you look at the dictionary, um, the Merriam-Webster in that case, we can find the following definition. It's the capability of machine to imitate intelligent human behavior. Oh, you cannot hear me? Let me try to fix that. I hope it's better now. Yes, can you hear me better? Much better. Okay, fantastic. Good. Yes, glad get it's better now. Okay, so AI is basically the capability of a machine to imitate intelligent human behavior is one of the um, definitions or a branch of computer science dealing with the simulation of intelligent behavior in computers. And then there's something which I read, which I just found so fantastic. AI is making computers act like they do in the movies. I really, really love this definition, to be honest. So, but this is not so far from the truth, because every time when we think about AI, and um, this is something in the movies, AI in the end is this super thing which is um, taking over the world because it learns so much constantly and evolved so much um, so that it basically outperformed us at some point. So that's a, it's a weird, I wouldn't call it definition, it's a weird statement, but actually it's an interesting way to think about. Um, so what is real AI? Um, especially in computer science, we think of AI usually as something where the computer um, learns over time in responses and changes uh, the own behavior and the own knowledge base, basically, as a reaction to the environment or to input. Um, and one interesting example here would be um, that Netflix recommendations, um, for instance, learn constantly by what what is your interest in what, what movies, in what genre, but, uh, and gives you smart recommendations constantly based on the on your personal input, however, also on the general environment. Um, yeah, a Twitter blacklist, however, is not changing. A, blick, a Twitter blacklist is basically something which is created once, but it is pretty much straightforward. Um, then there is something which is called the Turing test. Um, who can still remember what is the Turing test? Just looking at the, at the chat. Yes, we have some. Um, so the, the Turing test is always this um, concept that if you talk to a machine, um, like for instance, you chat to a machine and you are not entirely sure whether it, this is a, um, a real human or not. Um, yeah, 
And and what, what is also interesting to think about AI, usually it should be something what um, what it learns. This should be interesting enough that it would take humans some effort to learn. Yeah, more headlights. Um, AI also um, gives a lot of panic to a lot of people. So for instance, um, where all of a sudden the AI becomes racist um, or anti-feminist and pro-Hitler. Um, and there was this, wasn't there this interesting discussion between where where you had two people, uh, uh, two two bots on Twitter, and all of a sudden they it wasn't on Twitter, but it was two a, uh, AI bots, and they are um, they were starting to and um, talk to each other, and all of a sudden they started to evolve their language, and at the end they were talking to each other, but in a different, entirely different language. Um, coding cactus, yes, um, this is this is a lecture, so no coding on the live stream here today. Um, but we will have interesting guest lectures um, from a C coder. Um, yes, Python is a fantastic um, language to use for for such, such problems. And yeah, yeah, there was also a stream about two Alexas talking to each other. Um, I'm just interested who who has an Alexa. Okay. Google actually has some very cool um, experiments you can do. Let me show you some. So you Google, this is like a playground experiments with Google. And this is a collection of really interesting AI experiments. This is a huge playground. You can use everything of it. So this is AI and writing, AI and learning, AI and drawing. So many of those concepts are based on deep learning, for instance. Um, and and I think you can have the source code to everything, I think. I'm not sure. Um, but interesting experiments. This is one of my favorites, the quick draw experiment. So this is, I think, a small little game. So let me launch that. Let's draw a neural network learning to recognize your doodles. So um, it uses a huge doodling data set. You oh, it seems you can access this data set. And um, through neural networking, it sort of recognizes what you're trying to doodle. Let's see if, oh, how, how can I draw a lobster? So I, I, I am supposed to draw a lobster now in under 20 seconds. How does a lobster look like? And apparently, smart Google will recognize that. Uh, I see leg, or foot, oh, no. or knee, or candle, or anvil. Is this a lobster? I see flamingo. <laughs> no. Oh, I know. Ah. It's lobster. See? <laughs> yes. A teapot. OK, good. Um, I see moon, or spoon. Good. You, oh, you... I know. It's teapot. I think you get the idea why I um, went into programming and not into arts. A screwdriver, I think I still get I see water. this one. Or snake, or sword. No. How can I prove that? This is screwdriver. I'm stumped. <laughs> this is so much a screwdriver. Oh. OK, any, anyhow, <laughs> I think you get the idea. So that, that's, a, that's a really, really lovely. Um, summary of cool experiments and cool um, data sets too. Please try to do one and show me if you can make better screwdrivers than I can. So this is like AI in general. Again, a very, a little bit of a controversial topic, um, interesting topic, highly relevant. But then there's AI in games. Um, so AI like the real AI, or let's let's call it real AI for now, um, the fancy AI, um, and AI and games are two very different things. So I really like this um, 
this comment in the chat where someone mentioned that what is AI in games? A lot of if statements. This is to some extent pretty much true. However, there are also very interesting smart AI concepts. But I'm just saying if, if we talk about AI in games, it does not necessarily mean that we are talking about the most fancy, sophisticated, um, newest, innovative AI algorithms. But sometimes it's also the illusion of intelligent behavior and the illusion of intelligence. So when you can you remember from GDD1, I talked about the illusion of choice. Can you still remember that concept? The illusion of choice was, can I draw something? Huh. Pen. Let me quickly see if I can draw something somewhere. Oh, you just saw my drawing. Maybe you don't really want to see that. So the illusion of choice was basically, if this is your, okay. So this is your map. Let, let me see if, if no. Nah. Doesn't really work, does it? Can you see something? Ugh, not really. Okay, yeah. Okay, let 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 me draw this. Let me try. Uh, I'm not prepared. Is there something like paint? Yes. <laughs> okay. I'm already sorry for that. Okay. This escalated quickly. Okay. How does paint work? Okay. So this is your map, right? Good. Um, and usually as a player, you would start here. So, so this is this is you. This is um, you starting here. And the, the illusion of choice was the game designer wants you to get here. So this is where the game designer wants you to get next. This is the goal. So, however, um, you are in an open world. This means um, you, as a play player, you, you want to have full freedom. You want to have all the choices. You want to be able to go everywhere you want to go. Because it's an open world game, obviously. So how does the game designer get you from here to here, even though you could also move here? And there is one very smart way to do that. So you start as a level one character, right? So let's think of some sort of role playing game. And you are this small, little, tiny, weak um, level one character with your wooden stick as a, instead of a fancy sword. And then you think, oh, I'll just walk here. And all of a sudden, here is this monster waiting for you, a huge dragon with a level eight. 80. And here in this world and this area, all of the terrible monsters are 79. And here it's 78. So you can go there with your tiny little stick and try to fight the 79 mon monsters, but you probably won't survive for so long. So in the game, the game designer would create this environment where you basically has the illusion of choice that you can go everywhere, but in reality, there's only one safe way to go there. So this would be obviously the only way you can choose in the end because this is where the monsters with level two wait for you which you can actually pretty much survive um sir dialogue mentioned that this is a gothic map thank gothic map thank you so much i'm so happy that you recognized this by my pretty drawings yes okay glad you saw that too Good, so this is the illusion of choice. This is a really important game design concept. And the same, a very similar thing we, we are having um, in AI. So um, game design is a lot about um, giving players illusions and in AI and games, it is the illusion of intelligence. So um, usually when we 
think about AI um, in games, we think about generating responsive, adaptive, and intelligent behavior. We use pathfinding, we use decision trace, we use data mining, procedural content generation. Um, we usually do not facilitate, usually. Um, there are more and more games um, using that too. Um, but um, computer learning, machine learning, neural networks, and so on. So this is something which is usually not used so much. Um, but with this predetermined and limited set of responses um, to a limited set of inputs, we can still create this so-called smart illusion of intelligence. Yeah, good. Um, Look at all these fucking people blow up tower. What oh, yeah. the fuck? <laughs> what I left the, the video. Fuck? I left what? the video. Is that the whole team? Run away. Run away. Grills. I don't have any grills. Hi. But I can go to the. It... What is going on? Why? So let me quickly pause here. So what are we, what you're seeing here? So what game is this? What you're seeing here, this guy is having like a great fun multiplayer experience and and runs through this world and then all of a sudden he noticed that maybe like he's a real player, but then he encounters the first spot. There are a lot of bobs in World of Warcraft. So let me continue this video. Why is every team running around? Are these all bots? Are these all bots? So he encounters no this way. group of bots. No! So many bots. No! They're all bots! What? Dude, both teams are bots! What? Time so out. then all, Look at this shit! All of a sudden he realizes that bots. both teams are bots. <laughs> what? Both teams are running back and forth across the fucking... This is insane! Dude, that's that's really pathetic, dude. This game makes fucking billions of dollars, and everyone's a bot. Every single person, except for like me and like two other people. And then all of a sudden he realizes like he is in a world full of bots, and he's the only real human in the end. Let me go to the ending. Game. No one else is typing in chat. I actually might be the only player in this fucking game. Yeah, and this is a phase of frustration and not fun multiplayer experience anymore. But I, I still love this video. Oh, no, sorry. I messed up. Look at all these fu Good. So this is also the not so... It's the fun side of, of games and bots. But again, yeah. When you realize that in a, in a world with 20, 30 people, you're all of a sudden the last real human player, it might be interesting. And what are games also known for when we think of AI? On the one hand, it's bots destroying our game experience. And then we have a lot of fun, cool, um, I, I, really, I, I really call them features, um, interesting issues. Let's put it that way. Let's start with the issues. What's, what's this game? Who recognizes this game? Okay, so you just stole this car and this guy wants, wants this car back. Oh damn, the driver's side is blocked. It's cheating. Oh, I guess I just buy a new car. He just walks away. Well-designed AI enemy behavior. Um, I think it's the same. I oh, know, hey. Okay, and I also love this one. What game is this? Still today? Look at this guy. Oh no, she is seriously hurt, or even dead. Oh, I will set it over here so I won't smell her. AI logic. So there are a lot of interesting um, fails through AI, um, AI logic. And as a game designer, we definitely have the, the, um, the goal, the aim, 
that we create AI experiences which are interesting and not frustrating. I wouldn't call bugs like this as a huge failure. I mean, it does break the immersion, but it gives you some sort of entertainment at least. But what's um, one of the worst thing which can happen that due to AI game issues, the immersion is broken. Um, and there, there have been in the past, there have been a lot of AI in games issues, also from really, really famous games. So in Half-Life, for instance, in 1998, the pathfinding algorithm sometimes failed to find a reasonable way for all the NPCs to evade a thrown granite, rather than allow the NPC to attempt to bumble out um, of the way and risk appearing stupid. The developers instead, instead scripted the NPC to crouch down and cover in place um, in place in that situation. So in that case, you can just feel uh, see a lot of crouching um, NPCs. Um, um, in some corners. So this was known as the famous Half-Life crouch cover. Um, there was also interesting um, NPC behavior in Doom. Um, let me think of what happened there. Um, let, me, let me quickly recall in the, in the, mid, in the middle, uh, in, in between, um, also in the chat. Do you have any interesting examples for interesting um, um, AI behavior which you encountered in games. And again, this AI stupidity or especially predictive behavior also. If you immediately know how, um, what, what the AI will do, will absolutely break the immersion. Okay, I think I recall now what happened in Doom. I think in Doom you had the monsters and the monsters were starting at some point to fight each other. I think this is what you can see in this, in this um, screen too. So at some points the um, NPC started to fight each other. This was not as designed, but they kept it in the game because it was just an interesting feature. And it's not as unrealistic that all of a sudden also um, the animals could fight each other or have a, have a fight. Um, I like this quote from Albert Einstein. Um, Everything should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. Easiest way to design games, I guess. Um, so uh, good game design involves finding a balance between the computer's intelligence and the player's ability to win. Because I want to think, if you, if you create the most elaborate and most fancy version of an enemy, who is constantly winning over you. Obviously, um, I, I mean, if you create a perfect algorithm, the enemy will always win over human behavior in a digital world. Um, so you need to find a good balance between making the enemy or like any AI concept not too smart that the player can still have the ability to win, but also not that he or she finds this artificial, artificial stupidity. So basically where you have this constant feeling that, oh, if I aim directly at the player, the, uh, the, at the enemy, the enemy will always go one step to the right. So it's, it shouldn't be something predictive. It shouldn't, the, the enemy should not appear in any way unintelligent. So there actually, since again, a perfect algorithm would usually always outbeat um, a, any, any, any player. So there are some tricks how to dump down your own AI. So for instance, that you, that the, that the enemies have a horrible aim or that if there's an enemy approaching, that the enemy would miss the very first time. This is implemented in many games. And or that the enemy would pull back at the last minute. Especially the, the first tools are very interesting, for instance. Because again, an enemy with the perfect aim, you wouldn't have a really good um, experience. I already read about the flow experience, the flow curve in the um, in the chat. So this is actually a good example because um, if the play, you cannot be skilled enough 
to beat a perfect enemy. So you would immediately be in, in this part of the curve where you're dropping out because you are um, frustrated. Um, and again, like if you if you create an enemy and the enemy, for instance, misses the very first time, the player can immediately react and for instance, for instance, take cover or, or change the weapon or, or run away, whatever but just that there's some sort of a warning sign and give the player some time for reaction. So in general, when we talk about AI in games, there are four major parts um, which are incredibly interesting to look at. And um, all of those parts are parts we will talk about. So I'm not sure how far I will come today. Probably we will stop after playing games. But in general, um, AI can be used in the video games industry to, or in the video games in the in video games in general to play games, to contribute content to games again through procedural um, generation, through creating um, any behavior, anime behavior, and so on. Um, understanding players, um, this means that you're using algorithm like such as machine learning um, in combination with player data to get more insights about the um, player behavior. And then, and maybe a very interesting part, um, which will be definitely covered, not today, but in the next lecture, to design games. And here I'm thinking of different design patterns, actually, how to use AI elements to design games so that the AI is not used to create the game, but to as a major game design element. One very, very quick example would be the Alien game, for instance, where they, um, who, who played Alien Isolation in the chat? Um, Alien Isolation, anyone? Yes, this was a really cool game, wasn't it? And the most interesting part about a Alien, sorry, a alien isolation AI. I just figured, oh, was the AI, and so the alien was created in a way that the alien did not necessarily would immediately like kill you, but it was designed in a way that um, the alien would scare the scare you a lot. So basically, really to keep you in this constant constant tension that you're always a little bit terrified, horrified, and is crawling and sneaking always behind you. And this was, um, yeah, a really, really interesting AI concept. And the AI what was, um, and, and this was a really, really interesting aspect of the game. Okay, so AI used for playing games is probably one of the oldest concepts. So one example which I just have to show because I just love this so much is the Robocop. <laughs> Who knows the Robocop? I, I, I just love this so much. So those are all the like the small tiny nows the um, robots which you can program and they are all programmed to play soccer against each other. Um, I would love to show you thousands of videos of those tiny creatures. It's just they're just fantastic. Um, this is a very literal <laughs> way when I would say AI to play games. Okay, but let me go into the history. No, they, the cookie slash, you're right. They don't only have these bots at the RoboCup. There are many, many different um, robots and also, I think, virtual matches at the, at the RoboCup. And yeah, um, it's, it's just a really cool competition. Mm. Um, good. There is a video on that not enemy design in horror games. Um, one example, which I 
quickly want to add here because otherwise I will forget it um, and won't add it somewhere. In Left for that, they had a really interesting system too to maximize like the entire game itself. The eye of the entire game was created in a very interesting way. So basically that the difficulty of the game would dynamically adapt based on the current player um, um, the player skills. So you would play in teams most, most of the time. You would play in, in them and after that in teams. And based on how you would perform, the game would, with a so-called, I think it was called Game Master also, constantly adapt the current um, 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 difficulty of the game based on your um, needs. Let's put it that way. Very The AI director, yes. That's, that, this is how it was called. The AI director thinks pixel prophecy. Interesting, interesting concept. There's a really cool um, report about that if you want to read more. Good. AI to play games. Yeah. Um, very easy one. So this was the first time um, that AI was able to beat the um, chess champion, um, which was back then Gary Kaspar. Barov. This was 97. And the AI which was playing against him was IBM Blue. And this was one of his statements. I could feel I could smell a new kind of intelligence across the table. I'm not sure what people could smell, but interesting. Then 2011. Very famous match back then. Jeopardy. So this was IBM Watson and um, Ken Jennings um, was back then the, he had the longest unbeaten run at 74 winning appearances. And this was the first time that a um, machine won over um, the champion. And yeah, in the TV show Jeopardy. A more recent example. Go. Go is so much more complex than chess. So um, Go, the complexity of Go is way more complex than the complexity of chess. So it took until 2016 that Google's DeepMind was able to beat the Go um, um, master Lee Sedol. Also very interesting um, um, example. Um, Alpha Go and its successors use a Monte Carlo tree search algorithm to find the move based on the knowledge previously learned through machine learning. And I think they used a um, artificial neural network, a deep learning method, and trained it um, through both sources, human and computer play. Yeah, and then this neural network was trained to predict the uh, AlphaGo's own move selections and also the winner's games. This was Google's AlphaGo. And the most recent example is from 2019. I think, or is there a more recent one? Was, was there a more recent one? But this is DeepMind versus StarCraft. Um, so DeepMind's AI agents conquered human professionals at StarCraft too. Um, yeah, this was a very intense match and there's a really, really um, interesting discussion about that online, how it actually um, was was implemented and also it was only implemented um, for a very specific um, set of requirements so it's not like fully complete so um, the AI wouldn't be able to conquer all human pros um, so this was a very specific specific setup however still very very um, very interesting and very um, promising there are many, many, many comments here in the chat. Um, yeah, the, yeah, and 
open AI in Dota 2, that was something. Claudia Kirchmeier also just mentioned Dota 2, the world champions were beaten by the AI. Maybe can you provide a link on that? This would be also interesting. Yeah, it was very limited. It was very, the, li the limitations were really specific, but still a very interesting example. And this is um, from this fantastic book, which I showed you. Um, so here just, um, you can see sort of where the complexity of those specific games are. So when we think of chess, um, chess, you have always perfect information like checkers. So it's, it's very observable and it's deterministic. Um, when you think, and, it, and it's turn-based. So those are usually checkers, chess, and go are games which are a little easier, I guess, to work on. And StarCraft and also Dota, those are absolutely the worst cases because they're happening in real time. They're, um, you only have um, imperfect information and it's non-deterministic. So this is pretty much the worst case scenario which and super complex um, to, to play. Yeah. And um, just as a few examples, because right, uh, we cannot um, stop the slides without showing more GIFs. Um, this is how um, AI is trained to play Snake with um, deep reinforcement learning. You can look at the code online. So here's a GitHub profile. Very interesting um, project. So the goal of this project is um, to develop an AI bot able to learn how to play the game um, um, Snake, but from scratch. Um, so um, this, this person developed a really incredible um, deep, learn deep in reinforcement learning algorithm for that and used the basic system parameters related to a state, positive or negative reward based on actions. So very straightforward. And yeah, uh, more details are on his GitHub page. This is the equivalent to training AI how to play StarCraft. So this is the untrained agent on the left. And you can see the trained supervised agent on the right. Um, yeah. I think what's really interesting here, again here, this is the um, AI research environment. I think what's really cool um, that StarCraft 2 actually has an open um, interface that you can try out different algorithms for that. And an open source version of the DeepMind, DeepMind um, toolset is available. Um, Pi SC2, I think it's called, is also a really cool um, tool which you can use by that. And yeah, a lot of things which you can do. And to finish and to conclude this part um, before we switch to the guest lecture, um, why would we like AI in general to play our games at all? Um, because on the one hand, um, obviously, it can be used for testing purpose. If you're a game developer and you want to find loopholes, you want to find um, whether or not you're good game is well balanced, you can use AI, for instance, to play the game. Um, then on the other hand, sometimes it's good that if, you, if you're a human player and you need an opponent, then the opponent should be very interesting on the other hand. And yeah, um, it has a really interesting application scenarios, in the, especially in the QA and testing field. There are tons of them. Good. Um, so thank you so much for joining this part of the lecture. 